Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. If you're joining, we're just waiting for more participants to arrive. sharing and now everybody can see that here we go here we go okay can everybody see my slides okay okay and if you are a panelist uh, or if you're an attendee um feel free to introduce yourself via the chat let us know where you're joining us from I'm from I'm in New York City. So is Daniel Opes, the CEO of AFS International. Um, do our other panelists want to just quickly say where they're joining from? Kia ora, I'm Carla Ray, and I'm joining from Tingaranga Nui Atara, Wellington, New Zealand. Great. And Lee Wei. Kia ora koutou. I'm Lee Wei Chen. I'm joining you all from Tamaki Makoto here in Auckland in New Zealand. And so I'm just going to fiddle around with a few more settings really quickly um, while we wait for a few more people to join us. go. And it's so awesome to see so many people joining us from all over the world. So without any further ado, why don't we get started? Oh, if I can find the slides. <laughs> there we go. Can everybody see my main slide with our beautiful pink? Awesome. So thank you for joining us for today's webinar on making global citizenship education a national priority. So before we begin, it's 2021. We've all spent a lot of time on Zoom, but I don't think it ever hurts to remind everyone of some logistics. Um, you have been, if you're an attendee, muted upon entry, but we will unmute you when you use the raise hand function during the interactive portion of this webinar. And we really would love to hear your voices. There is a designated time for questions and answers at the end, we'll make sure. Um, but you are totally welcome to send questions via the Q&A function in Zoom at any time. We would love to see you sending in your thoughts, reflections, feedback throughout the whole webinar. We are recording this webinar, just so you're aware, and afterwards you'll receive a link. And it's also being live streamed on AFS's YouTube channel so that it's more available and also more inclusive. So thank you all so much for joining us today, and I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists. Great, thank you so much, Nikki, and it's um, a pleasure to welcome you all. My name is Daniel Opes. I'm the president and CEO of AFS Intercultural Programs. Uh, it's really delight. I'm delighted to welcome you to this important discussion on making global citizenship education a national priority. And this discussion follows right on the heels of the APEC CEO Summit, which brings together world leaders from the 21 member economies of the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation um, and New Zealand served as the host this year. So I think this is a very appropriate conversation. AFS is so thrilled to also co-organize this session together with Education New Zealand. And if we um, use APEC as a backdrop, um, to me, one thing that really stood out in the um, APEC CEO Summit, I had the privilege to listen to a conversation between Jacinda Ardern, New Zealand's prime minister, and Angela Merkel, who is the outgoing chancellor of Germany, of course, who was invited as a special guest of APEC. And what struck me most is when the two of them talked um, and when they talked about leadership and what mattered most about leadership, they both emphasized the importance of recognizing our interdependence, of being willing to listen to each other's perspectives, of being able to take collective action. And so essentially they were really talking about the values of global competence. And um, that's so important because so often when we talk about global citizens or global citizenship peace, people think that it is about stamps and passports. 
but that's not it. It is about recognizing our interdependence. It's about understanding that we are part of a global commons, that we have a responsibility both to our local communities and the world. And we certainly have enormous challenges that we're facing. And I would argue that if we are serious about addressing them, it's mission critical that we invest in global citizenship education and an expanding intercultural understanding. And so that's why I'm so thrilled that we are convening this discussion today and to talk about why this matters, what governments are doing or can do, and what young people need in order to act and thrive as global citizens. So before we dive into our conversation, I want to just very briefly introduce our um, wonderful panelists. And um, because we are convening this uh, together with Education New Zealand. Let's start with Carla, Carla Ray Vasquez. I had the privilege of working with you when you were at AFS. Now you're at Education New Zealand and you actually have global citizen in your job title. So Carla, just say a word about yourself. Daniel, to all authorities, all languages, all cultures, to the many voices that I gather here today, behold the bread of life. Ko andes te maunga pae, ko Rio Bogotá te awa, ko Rey Vázquez te iwi whanau, no Colombia ahau, ke manapo ki te au e mahi ana, ko Kala toku engoa. As Daniel said, my name is Kala Rey Vázquez. Uh, I call the Andes my mountains, and my river is the Bogotá River. I come from Colombia, and I now work for Education New Zealand. E noho ana o ki te panganui atara, Ko tene toku mihi ki nga tangata whenua o te rohe nei, ka mihi hoki au ki nga tahu o te rohe nei, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I do now have the privilege of calling uh, Te Whanganui Atarao Wellington, my home. So I take this opportunity to acknowledge the indigenous people of this land and the important landmarks of this area. And also my acknowledgement to you all. It is a total pleasure to be here. And as Daniel says, bringing together two of my passions um, and, and sort of Turanga YY places of home, um, AFS and Education New Zealand. Over to you, Lee Wei, to let us know who you are. Kia ora koutou, everyone again. So my name's Lee Wei. Um, I have recently had the privilege to represent Aotearoa New Zealand um, at APEC, APEC Voices of the Future. So this is around bringing um, 21, um, 21 um, economies, um, four different um, people representing each economy um, to form a declaration that we put up towards the APEC chair. So this is a, an annual thing, um, but this, this year signifies, um, I guess, a step towards in, the inclusion space within young people's voices at that leader's table um, and actually handing over that declaration towards our Prime Minister here, um, Jacinda Ardern. Um, so a, a little bit about my background, um, I currently work for Auckland Unlimited, um, the local economic development agency for here in Tamaki Makoto, um, and I currently work in climate change and sustainability, so very in the midst of all of this, and very at the forefront of um, what young people's voices should be at the table, um, so a huge privilege to speak to you guys all today, um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Carla. Thank, thank you, Li Wei. Um, Romina will join us in just a minute. And so we'll let her introduce herself when, when she's here. We um, get to um, really start our discussion. Um, what I want to do now very briefly is to just introduce our um, organizing organizations, AFS, as well as Education New Zealand. So just a word about AFS. Many of you, of course, know AFS. We are founded more than 100 years ago have nearly 75 years of experience in exchanging um, people around the world and really advancing intercultural understanding in the world. As you can see, we have a huge global reach with 50,000 volunteers around the world, 500,000 program alumni. And I think what's really special about AFS is that we are in 55 countries with national organizations and of course also in New Zealand. And we're very excited that AFS New Zealand will be celebrating their 75th anniversary next year. So we very much look forward to a lot of celebrations around our work in New Zealand. If we um, go to the next slide, Nikki, our impact goals at AFS are really focused in three key priority areas. One is 
we want to develop more active global citizens. And we're going to talk about that, of course, more today. Um, our second impact goal focuses on how can we actually get to scale, and that really requires um, supporting schools and other institutions in their efforts to globalize. And then finally, how do we make sure that intercultural learning um, and global citizenship um, development is not just something for the elite, but is uh, an opportunity for everyone. So expanding access to intercultural education is a key priority for us. Um, Carla, um, would you like to introduce Education New Zealand briefly? Oh, kia ora. Um, so Education New Zealand is what we called a crown entity. So what that basically means in New Zealand is that we're not a ministry, we're not a policy making body, but we do get instructed by the minister in the case of the Ministry of Education as to how we can deliver on um, education policies, in particular for us about international education. So that's sort of the context upon which we operate. We, uh, in, there's a whole range of ways in which we do this. Our main role is to promote New Zealand as a study destination. Um, and then the other way that, the way we think about it is about the fact that in order to create a thriving and globally connected New Zealand, we need world-class education to do that. Um, we administer, particularly my team administers scholarships, which are both inbound and outbound. And you might know of the Prime Minister's Scholarship to Asia and Latin America, which takes about 500 students um, every year to those countries when borders allow us to do so. Uh, and then the, we spread the word for New Zealanders about the importance of international education in terms of social, cultural and economic benefits. We also help um, education institutions, universities, uh, English language schools, schools to have the capability to provide an excellent student experience. So that's sort of the realm upon which we operate. Great, thank you so much, Carla. And, and let's start the conversation. I wanna start with, with you, Carla, and um, your commitment. Uh, Nick, Nikki, we'll, we'll come to that in, in, in just a moment. Um, I wanna to get to, to Carla to talk a little bit about um, New Zealand and your um, government has really clearly prioritized global citizenship education, which to me is something um, really quite rare um, in, in government policy. A global citizenship education is part of your international education strategy. Talk to us a little bit about how this strategy came about, the role um, you are placing, your government is placing on global citizenship and what are the implications? Great. Um, and I have to caveat that I wasn't part of the process of creating the international education strategy. This was really led by the minister, the Ministry of Education. Uh, but several of our ENC uh, staff were part of it, including uh, my boss, Shahin Nepala. And so I had a bit of a chat with her about what the process was like. And I think what's important to understand is that, that it was a huge government-led consultative process. And so it involved people across what we call the international education sector, as well as uh, tourism and businesses. So it was this really integrated approach. And it involved voices from education providers, cross-government agencies, community groups, um, but also it took a really student-centered approach and students were a key part of that process. So they were both included in terms of uh, the concerns, the voices directly being part of the consultation and then the feedback process for it. Um, I think this strategy really signals a key point for international education in New Zealand where so far we've been quite concerned on sort of um, getting students here, right? The number of students, what was, was driving the sector. And then this marks a point where we focus a conversation on what can international education mean for New Zealand? And what does it bring for New Zealanders overall, right? What if you're not traveling? What if you're not connected in any way to that international experience? What are the benefits that it can still um, lead for people? And so um, I think from, from the beginning of the process, there were this really three clear goals that, uh, that became evident. So one was about the importance of an excellent education and student experience. Um, the second one was about sustainable growth. And so that was about, you know, how can we ensure that this uh, demand that we can uh, fulfill the needs of students here, that, you know, that uh, the experiences we're offering um, are gonna be um, valuable, that we're not reliant on a single market. Um, and then, and then here came global citizenship. And I think global citizenship really emerged as this way of 
connecting and delivering for both international and domestic students. It becomes sort of like the glue that helps us make sense of those experiences. Um, and so it also acknowledges that we, we need international education. You know, we can't, we're, we're an isolated island, even more so now uh, at the bottom of the Pacific, but we rely connectivity to strengthen our New Zealand culture. Um, so it's how do we foster that globally connected New Zealand? Um, I think it's useful. One of the things that I learned from that conversation as well is that the strategy was developed under one government. It was a, a national government, uh, but it was implemented and launched and implemented under the labor, the current labor government. And what's interesting about that is sort of has made it sort of apolitical or transcend any political uh, queries. And I think that that really talks to the strength of those three key pillars. Um, I guess the implication for us of having global citizenship as one of the guiding principles is that um, international education sector and providers have a, have a common language to talk about this uh, and key actions that will help us build that quality of international education. Um, and, and I remember talking, it very much speaks to your third goal there as well, um, Daniel, because I there was a chat recently of all schools around New Zealand. And I remember the, um, the principal of Oropi Primary School, and he talked about the importance of making global citizenship a national priority, because if we just leave it to chance, then only the privileged benefit from it, right? So that's been a real driving force for it for now more recently. Um, and yeah, I think the fact that it touches on, on all students more generally. Thank you. I mean, it's so interesting that you say, I mean, you know, a real test is can a strategy like that transcend politics um, and it seems to have with, withstood that change. How about the pandemic? I mean, how, how has that actually impacted um, your international education strategy that then is relatively new? What, 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 what are you seeing there? Yeah, so I, so one thing about the pandemic is obviously, uh, I don't want to minimize the effects of it. It has been a really stressful time um, across the sector. And uh, I think particularly in New Zealand, around the uncertainty of when the borders will open, you know, we still currently have uncertainty about when students, international students will be able to return to New Zealand. Um, but it has actually been a great opportunity for global citizenship education and for the strategy as a whole. And um, there was a document published in 2020, which is called the recovery plan, or sort of marks the roadmap, how we think the sector is going to recover. And it actually says, um, we are going to accelerate on how we implement the strategy. So the goals are still really important. And I just wanted to talk about four key ways in which I think actually the pandemic has helped us and has increased interest in global citizenship. Um, the first one is that it has given us an opportunity to rethink how we can deliver on that mission and purpose, that idea that a thriving and globally connected New Zealand is fostered by international education because it's allowed us to innovate, you know? So we've looked at sort of, and it was all about bringing people into New Zealand and, and we used to say study in New Zealand and we quickly changed to study with New Zealand. Um, and this idea that you could study, you could start your um, student experience either offshore with an idea to then once borders open or in the future uh, come to New Zealand. Um, and then also you could do online and we're doing a whole range of diversification of products in that space of which some of the common link of that New Zealand experience is global citizenship education being at the core of it. Um, I think it's given an importance of global citizenship in general because New Zealanders are re realizing that they cannot remain isolated from the world. And it has highlighted that international education is a key way to help our own students connect with the world. Um, and I think the GCC, the Global Competency Certificate Program we've been running together with AFS is a great example of that, where we've connected classrooms in New Zealand to classrooms around the world, teachers in New Zealand with teachers around the world, and has said, you know, through those connections, you develop as global citizens. So the purpose remains the same, how you deliver it can be quite creative. Um, the third point is about, it's actually something that SIVA, the Schools International Business Association, um, uh, they did a report on how uh, the school sector could recover. And, and one of those striking points of that report is they say, why will we, what will we say to the world about what we did with our two years being closed down. We can't just come back in the same format that we had before, and we can use global citizenship to reimagine what that would look like. 
Um, and I think especially in the school sector, but I think across the sectors, we had this idea that international departments work quite separately from say people doing citizenship education or philosophy or um, civics or, you know, and it's this great opportunity to say, how can we benefit both groups? So maybe, and, and Steve was talking about rethink your international department to be a global citizenship department. Rethink your international strategy to be more holistic around global citizenship. And then the final point I'd like to make is sort of thinking about the future and it's about when international travel becomes more likely again and when our borders reopen, these initiatives are not just going to go away. You know, we're not going to go back to business as usual, but it's this sort of new integrated system where you might start your experience through an online um, course, through uh, an online exchange, where you already get to meet the people that you might visit and come to live with later on in your life. And it's all part of a new integrated system. So I feel really excited about the possibilities of that. Thanks so much for sharing that, Carla. And I think it's like so important for you to emphasize that this is um, not going back to usual, but actually how do we actually integrate what we've learned and accomplished in the past 18 months or so as a result of the pandemic. Um, before I turn to Romina um, from UNESCO who just joined, I just want to uh, put a little bit of context because I think this is where Romina's um, specialty also comes in, is around global citizenship education. And so, Nikki, if you could pull up the slides, and I just want to share two short items there um, around what we mean when we actually talk about global citizenship education. And really, um, it's um, something that is defined by UNESCO, something that is part of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It's, it's um, target 4.7. And it's really about empowering learners to not just know things about the world, but to also be able to take action, both globally, but also in their local communities. Um, so this is something that I think is exactly what transcends um, the international exchange of people, but goes much more deeply into the role that everybody can take in their local community. Every local citizen can also be a global citizen. And at AFS, as well as for Education New Zealand and many other organizations, in many cases, global citizenship education really also means developing global competence. And if you go to the next slide, Nikki, um, the OECD um, has a very powerful definition of global competence. They now have recently measured this as part of the PISA report, the Program for International Student Assessment. Um, and it really looks at four key dimensions, um, the capacity to examine local, global, and intercultural issues, appreciating um, perspectives and worldviews of others, engaging in open and effective interactions with people from different cultures, and also to act for collective well-being. So this is not just a state you assume, but also some action that you take. And I think that's so important. So um, you can stop sharing the slides, Nikki, and I wanna to turn to um, Romina uh, from UNESCO. Thanks so much for joining us. Briefly introduce yourself. You're from Chile, which of course is an APEC member economy, but uh, I saw someone else posting Pura Vida from Costa Rica. I think you're based there. Um, so share a word about where you're from, what you do, and then talk a little bit about um, your role and engagement in global citizenship education with UNESCO. Thank you so much. Um, well, my name is Romina Gassman. I'm education specialist at UNESCO, currently based in San Jose. I'm in charge of the education sector in our multi-country office. So we cover Costa Rica, eh, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Panama. And I was previously, previously working uh, in Chile uh, coordinating uh, regional programs in education, but also working a lot in global citizenship education because my expertise for 20 years has been that. But I have to tell you something is that I'm Argentinian. And uh, <laughs> so I used, to I used to live in Chile for some years, but I'm Argentinian. And I'm, I'm passionate for democracy and I found education to be a, dr a driver for, for democracy. So um, we know that a sustainable, equitable, inclusive, peaceful democracy uh, can be achieved um, if 
only we have a culture of democracy and education, not only, but education can play uh, a big role. So I approach it, uh, democracy from there. I'm a, I'm a political scientist, so I, I went from there, but, but I have like 20 year experience um, in, in Latin America, working in different organizations in the field, advising governments and uh, in NGOs. Uh, you know, I, I, I experienced like many, many sectors uh, working in, in, this, in this field, which is uh, a passion uh, for me. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Romina. And um, I mean, as you heard from Carla, um, what mm -hmm. the government of New Zealand has done in terms of prioritizing Uh, mm -hmm. Global citizenship education is, is, is pretty outstanding, and, but, but many countries um, have not really prioritized that yet. So I'm curious to know what um, does UNESCO do or regional bodies like your multi-country um, office in, in UNESCO, how do you support national governments in terms of the integration of global citizenship education into the curriculum or into national policies? Perfect. Thank you. So. Um, First of all, what I would like to say is that, um, and I will speak for, for Latin America. I, I, I know examples around the world, but I prefer to focus on, on Latin America and the, and the Caribbean. And is that even though countries don't have exactly the, the concept of global citizenship education, they are already doing civic citizenship education, human rights education, peace education, and that's important And that, that is one of the way we, we support countries is promoting contextualized dialogue because um, our organizations sometimes, you know, put outside some um, concepts and some, and some ideas to, uh, to advocate for, 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 in this case, for transforming education. That is target 4.7 is the transformation of education. And one more thing is that Within the right of education, we cannot get out of global citizenship education, education for sustainable development, human rights education, gender equality. So what I'm saying is that according to the SDG 4, the 2030 education agenda, learning, for example, about global citizenship education and education for sustainable development is part of the of a human right. Is part of the, uh, the, the education, the human, the, the education human right. So that is one thing. It's not just uh, a learning for a, for privileged people. You know, it's not just the learning that takes care extracurricular. It has to be part of the curricula. It has to be part of teacher professional development. It has to be part of. Um, you know, the, um, the, the activities of, of, uh, of the schools, it, it has to be part. So that is one, uh, one important thing. So we promote the dialogue and also because when you promote the teaching and learning of global citizenship education and related uh, target 4.7 issues, you need an ecosystem because education cannot work alone. And, and the pandemic can show you that. For example, if you see um, the, the right to education and how communities and the governments, the state and the schools and the teachers and the families and the students and neighbors and everybody supported education. That was an example of global citizenship education, global citizenship education and involvement that went above and beyond all the frontiers, formal, non-formal and informal education. So the exercise of citizenship education is a, con it's a continuum, it's a, it's, a, it's, a daily, it's a daily exercise. So um, what, I, what, I want to, what I want to mention is that um, when we work with the countries is first of all, recognizing value and, and, and promoting the dialogue um, about these issues and advocating for their prioritization in the agenda. There are so many issues that are important in education, but this has also to be part. So we promote that dialogue. And through that dialogue, we empower, we empower voices to put, to put this. Because if we want to rethink education, like we are talking all about rethinking education, rethinking development, we need more participation and we need that to be inclusive. And if we want that, target 4.7 is the, is the kind of, protagonist of the agenda. We know the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development talks about the rights of rights and freedom of, of the people. But target 4.7 is the empowerment for people to achieve them. It's, it's like to look for them for indi individually and also for collective purpose. So 
we collaborate with governments also in this in top in terms of curriculum, in terms of curriculum curriculum development, review, reform, in uh, also teacher professional development, initial and, and continuous. We also do like, for example, last week I, I've been in El Salvador, so I go and do and do <laughs> training workshops with teachers, principals, also um, thinking about the, the whole school approach. Important that the, 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 this is not just a project for, for teachers. Or for a school or for the principals. This is a project of all the school. So citizenship education has to be that. But I want to emphasize once again one thing is that countries already have this. So they may they may ask, you know, for a spaces for dialogue, you know, inside dialogue, also uh, reinforcing some aspects of this of this ecosystem. Uh, as, as I mentioned, you know, I can do a lot of things at, at the schools, but outside, I also need a democratic environment. I also, I also need a, an environment that promotes the participation because I can tell young people and children, oh, you, you need to participate, you need to act, but then the ecosystem, you know, from the school, the school, the, their houses, their communities don't, um, don't allow for that. And I want to finalize saying that one important thing we have been working and dialoguing with, with, um, with governments, it's about uh, mainly ministries of education, is this holistic approach. This approach of cognitive, social, emotional, and behavioral skills, the development in, in, in children, youth, and people, you know, all, throughout the, the life, lifelong learning of this. Because sometimes curriculum and teacher and teacher preparation are focused on cognitive, you know, are, and, and you can see that cognitive, for example, is more present in secondary education because that is when test comes. Primary education, more social emotional skill also for pre-primary, but there's absence in, in most curriculums of the, of the action. And I want to, to emphasize that what we promote is that you cannot make any, any action, you cannot make any, any decision if you don't have a basis in cognitive, you know, the cognitive skills and also social emotional uh, skills. And within that, I, I would like to, to add one dimension in that global competence framework, which is the sense of belonging to a common humanity. Sometimes people said, oh, the global is against the local. No, no, no. It's what, the, what we promote and try to put in the, in the table is that, that Roussonian idea, that, that idea from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, that you, we are part of a whole. And so we are, if the others are as well. So that sense of humanity is not, not opposing us, is we build that, that world sense if we begin with our family, with our schools, with our neighbors and communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Romina. I mean, that's such a powerful comment, right? It's our common and shared humanity. And also the way you describe where global citizenship education fits in, I find, I find very um, powerful because so often and what we hear often from teachers is, is this notion of competing priorities and other things are more important, but you're actually saying it is part of an ecosystem. It's part of a whole school approach. It is not extracurricular. It's not optional. It is part of the whole. And so I think that's a really powerful thing. And so it's not a binary thing. You either do this or do that. You do all of it. Um, this is a good opportunity to bring in Li Wei, um, because you also said, you know, in, in some instances, the school curricula um, are absent of the action component, right? And this need for community skills. And Li Wei, you, when we spoke earlier, you shared that for you, global citizenship really started from a very local place. So talk a little bit about kind of your journey in global citizenship. Yeah, thanks for that, Daniel. Um, also like to just acknowledge, I guess, um, Education New Zealand here on the call as well, and uh, my colleague um, Jamila Hernandez from Auckland Limited as well. Um, so um, as sort of part of my journey um, at, at a young age at 15, um, I, I started getting involved around youth advocacy within my local um, community. So I did that for about five years. Um, so over that journey, I learned about um, what does it mean for, I guess, civic participation? What, what does it mean for democracy? Understanding that political side, that, that is usually quite boring for young people. Um, but I guess that's something that we need to work on is how can we make that more attractive for young people and to get more vocal? And I think we, we are seeing that generation now um, being part of that. And so um, 
after those five years of youth advocacy, um, dur well, during that time, I, I was privileged to um, study um, at the University of Auckland. I studied a human geography degree and I, I came across this report, um, the Brundtland report, and it, and it came with the definition of what is sustainable development around meeting the needs of our current generation without compromising future generation needs. So really seeing, um, really eye-opening to see um, that this is a very, I guess, pivotal time to sort of see um, that we have to sort of have a future and have a future for our future generations. And so having that um, alongside being able to grow my youth advocacy, being able to sit on a, a youth advisory panel that advised the mayor here in Tamaki Makoto, Auckland, um, with what, what's so important about young people. And then I was privileged to be part of, um, I guess, engaging with um, the US Embassy on their youth council on that level. And I had these other opportunities to represent um, both my city in Beijing, um, as well as um, in Japan for a ship for world youth, and then more recently, the APEC Voices. And then we, when I tie that all together, um, uh, I, I'm really, uh, I really can sort of put that into my work um, right now, working for the Auckland Economic Development Agency, because I know that um, within this sort of public sector and job that it is important. So how can I bring those views onto this local scale and sort of for me is sort of where, where is my next step also understanding where can I grow this um, impact by scale that's something that I sort of align to myself with is um, let, let's just keep growing this impact by scale and sort of see um, how far I can go and I really hope that um, there are no limits. Um, this is um, very powerful and, and I think also like you, you describe a really um, great journey that I could imagine is the case for many people. Most people probably don't start their global citizenship um, journey from the perspective of the world, right? They started in their local community about issues that are um, that they care about there, that matter there, and then kind of scale out, well, how do you address that? And you start seeing that these issues have um, broader impact or ramification outside of the community. So I, th I find that to be really an interesting journey. I would be curious to hear from you, um, especially you, you were at APEC, you heard leaders, you spoke to leaders about issues that matter to you, including climate action. Um, where does all of this register for them as, as leaders, right? Like what should governments do more to support young people in that journey? You say you wanna go next. Is there something that governments could do or should do that they aren't doing now? Yeah, so um, sort of provide more context around, I guess, the APEC voices. Um, uh, like I mentioned earlier, that this is the first time that the APEC chair is, I guess, formally acknowledging that. This is only the start of the journey, and there's so much more that that can um, grow from this. Um, we, we understand that us usually young people uh, are a tip box, but now that um, acknowledging this as a first step and so much more is great. Um, I, I guess sort of if I dig a little bit deep into the APEC voices of the future, um, there's sort of some key themes that is sort of pinnacle to young people. And, and that is around what does it mean for international cooperation to combat COVID-19? What does it mean as a digital future? We know that this generation is the generation um, of the future when it comes to a digital economy. Um, what does it mean for climate change? We see um, activists across the world sort of are really um, fighting for climate action. and and what does it mean for inclusivity? We've got our indigenous communities across the world and really how can we empower these other marginalized groups as well? So those were sort of the themes that we covered. And when I sort of looked at um, sort of call to actions within our declaration, there were sort of three key themes that stood out. One was around education. So how can we um, create better investment into um, more quality education as well as a larger digitalization? Um, we, we, we know that from this COVID-19 that um, digitalization is so important, um, both for our young people as well as for our economies and further out uh, as well. And then, so another, the second point was around equity. So sort of, how can we address the inequities there? Are? I, I think that's been touched on prior to uh, me around um, that international education isn't just for, I guess, the privilege, it's, it's also for everyone else. So how can we sort of address that? Um, and also how can we stop any, um, I guess, and equities that are exacerbating because of COVID-19, because of the climate crisis and any further sort of social disparities. And the third one, I think Carla touched on this a lot around how we're doing this here um, with Education New Zealand across, um, I guess, Aotearoa New Zealand here around how can we 
a wellbeing approach and really urging um, world leaders to really be, hey, um, let's look at social, environmental and economic wellbeing because they are interwoven together. And, and then when it comes to calling out these APEC leaders, it's around accountability and actions. Really, like, what does that look like? And how can we actually measure what success means? Um, and really, how can we actually get that young, young people's voice at the table? Because young people know best what their future is. Um, so it's so important to employ those young people. It's, um, it's so important to be able to um, have that voice to be equal um, at that table as well. Thank you for that. And let, let me pick up on one piece around kind of equity and inclusion that you mentioned and bring in Carla, because it also relates to a question we had in the Q&A from Marcella, who asked about how Education New Zealand is integrating local diversity in the strategy. I'd also be interested to know it's kind of like what role does equity and inclusion play in general in that strategy? Because so often international education appears by fault not equitable, right? Because it is so focused on the international mobility of students, which is of course incredibly important, but it is also about how do we reach more people who may not be able to participate in international exchange. So how are you dealing with that both local diversity, but also equity and inclusion, Carla? Yeah, and that's a huge question, of course. So you could take the whole, the whole time talking about that. So I'm going to talk particularly from the New Zealand context where we have a bicultural relationship and engagement with Māori, which is founded on what we call Te Tiriti of Waitangi, which is sort of this founding document signed in the 1840s between the Crown and 500 Māori chiefs. And, and to give you a history lesson in two minutes, uh, the principles of that document are about participation, so making sure that there is Māori participation at all levels and that no decision that affects Māori is made without Māori. Uh, then there's a principle of protection so that we have equal rights and protecting positions. So that's about the prote protection of tikanga or cultural or protocols, ways of doing things, taonga, treasures, as well, such as te reo, the Māori language, and then respect in that those, those values, those worldviews are giving equal footing um, to tikanga and taonga of other cultures so that, you know, we can value uh, a Maori spiritual worldview the same way that we value Western views of, of certain things and that there are certain specific realms that they are the realm of Maori. Um, and then the third and, and for me the most important point is around partnership. So the, the Te Tiriti acknowledge the sovereignty, the governance and working together with the same rights and benefits as subjects of the crown so that we so that when we um, work with Maori they're not they don't come in at the last point to kind of tick the boxes and tell us we've done a great job with a strategy or with any document, but that they're involved at the very beginning at the same equal footing. Um, that's, uh, you know, we, I, I'm, I'm being really honest, we're in the beginning of that journey in terms of our strategy. Um, but what I think is really key is that we need to get biculturalism right before we then engage with everything else. But it has clear implications for equity and inclusion. The way we work at it at ENZ is we have our Maori advisor, Kyle Wixon, and he's heavily involved with us in this process, as well as um, ensuring we have, we're connecting with Maori um, around Aotearoa New Zealand, because there's no one Maori voice, right? It's very different being Maori and Tamaki Makoto than being um, rural Maori, maybe in the South and the South Island. So it's about that involvement. So the way we've uh, conducted our sort of roadmap for the implementation of global citizenship is including all of those voices. And that's given us some really interesting um, findings, very much on the line of what Ramina was talking about, about that local connection. And I think also is understanding that global citizenship is not a new concept, is not a trend. It's actually the way that Tangata Fenua, indigenous people have worked and operated for many years. And so that's what I will say about equity and inclusion is that we need to understand and um, make the most of that knowledge as a way of connecting those, um, those uh, populations that have missed out on international education because of the way our systems are set up. Um, and I wanna just to finish by giving you an example of how, cause that seems quite ethereal, like what does it mean bringing indigenous knowledge into global citizenship education? Um, I wanted to read an extract that Carl has been working on in terms of explaining global citizenship from a Te Māori perspective. And I'll just read 
uh, very briefly. Um, it touches on uh, Amihi, which was the introduction that I did earlier in the presentation as well. So he said, when we introduce ourselves through the extending Mihi and Pepeha, we're sharing our postcode by way of identifying our mountain, our ocean, and our river by which we can be found. And in doing so, creating and identifying our kinship links. In this context, water connects us, whereas line divides us through its natural barriers and through recognition of tribal territories. Based on Maori ontology, that understands where all of the earth, connected by water and common ancestry to our sky father and earth mother, we recognize all as kin. This is reflected in the proverb, koao ko koe, ko koe koao, I am you and you are me. This very sentiment was reflected by our Prime Minister, a much quoted phrase on the hills of the Muscatacks, they are us. There is a sense of unity in this concept that binds us together. If you accept the view and position that we are all kin, then it drives a duty of care for each other, that we look after our king, that love, is unconditionally given, but we can also call each other out in the spirit of kinship and that conflict is normal, but does not change the premise of our relationship with one another based on unconditional love and duty of care. And I just think that that's global citizenship in such a much more articulate way we've ever seen it before. And so the work we're doing now is we're inviting Maori around the Ruhe to have a wananga in February, which is gonna be for Maori by Maori, which is gonna provide this indigenous definition of global citizenship, as well as some targets and goals for us um, of how we're gonna make sure that Maori uh, benefit from our work. Thank you for, for sharing that. I think that's a really um, beautiful way of, of thinking about global citizenship. Um, let me bring Romina in. Um, a couple questions that came up in the chat kind of around um, global citizenship education policy and are there intergovernmental mechanisms pushing for that? So, and I think one key intergovernmental mechanism is the fact that global citizenship education is one of the um, UN uh, target in the UN sustainable development goals clearly, but talk a little bit more about kind of how, you know, how or if there are intergovernmental mechanisms doing that. And related to that second question, has the pandemic decrease the importance of global citizenship or increase the importance? I think that's actually really quite an interesting um, dynamic because we're seeing so much more polarization, right? So what, what, what does that say actually where, where the world is at when it comes to this? So Romina, let me bring you in. Thank you so much for uh, the questions. Um, regarding intergovernmental mechanisms, yes, of course, there is a dialogue, global, regional, sub-regional dialogue, because this is a topic that comes with the uh, 2030 education agenda, the SDG4. Um, so this is part of the global dialogue. And in fact, uh, I was taking uh, my pen right after I finished my presentation, uh, my, 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 yeah, my, my comments in, in, the, in the previous turn, because one of the things I forgot to mention, and it's very important, is that UNESCO promotes dialogue between member states at the global, regional, and sub-regional levels. And, and why that is important? Because that is the building of how countries first conceive global citizenship education according to their, to their, to their realities. So global citizenship education and related concepts are concepts that link to the present, link to the past, because memory dealing, dealing with, with that difficult past that, 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 that we have. Many of our countries deal with colonization, with dictatorship, violation of human, massive violation of, of human rights, atrocities. So it connects to the past, it connects to the present, it connects to the, to the future. So in every dialogue that talks about with rethinking education, rethinking development, global citizenship education, and education for sustainable development cap, uh, comes at the top. And that is connected with the idea of the, um, is, um, if global citizenship education increase or not, or decrease, and yes, it has been increased its importance in, uh, in the agenda, because it's a way of, it's, it's, um, it's a space, no, it's not just a subject. It's not, it's, uh, it is as really today is a space and it's, and it's a thematic, a field for promoting the dialogue about how we can rethink and transform education and make education a protagonist 
of the recovery of the pandemic. And it's not just education. When we talk about education, we talk um, about uh, the people. And one thing I want to, to mention, link to this, and, and with this I finalized, is that today we are also thinking, we, we think about development and we think about cons consumption and production models, but we also think about democracy and we also think about institutions. When, when we talk about um, global citizenship education and, 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 and related concepts, we talk about what type of education on these issues our eyes need. So in the beginning, you know, when we have these transitions to democracy, civic, civic education was a protagonist. Then citizenship education, incorporating issues that have to do not only with civil and political rights, but with social rights and also the issues of living together and acting together and addressing issues that has to do with inequality, for example, that uh, the lead Wei Ching was, uh, was, was talking about. So in this journey, in, in our journey uh, to democracy, that 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 is an idea. The democratization processes, you know, this 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 uh, breaking of um, uh, social, economic, and political rights. That's uh, you, you know that we are opening we are opening those doors. Need a strong uh, citizenship citizenship education, human rights education, or the concept you would like to use. But the important thing is that how we um, stop the reproduction and exacerbation of inequalities. And this and this thematic area is kind of a response. It's a door to find a response and to be active about that. Thank, thank you so much. Um, um, Li Wei, I see you smiling. Do you have a comment um, on what you just heard from, from Romina? Because I think you, you're, you're seeing that a lot in your kind of day-to-day -day, um, activity as a young activist who wants to see change? What, how do you see this? Yeah, no, I, I definitely see that there's, I guess, this framing everything that there's such great opportunity to be able to address, um, I guess, address anything that, that we do have pressing here um, and that to, to actually solve, I guess, any inequities that do exist. Um, there and taking that really holistic approach. I, I think uh, when I sort of bring it back down to this local scale, uh, I'm just so, I guess, so fortunate and so privileged to live here in Auckland, how multicultural and have that sort of safe environment to be able to bring that sort of civic participation, having that education, um, both, I guess, in a lived experience around me, as well as through these institutions, education institutions within this workspace um, as well. Um, I, I do see that there are still barriers, um, I guess, for young people to still, um, I guess, a voice, um, to have their voices equal at that table. Um, I, I think we, we need to enable that safe space um, for young people to be able to exchange that dialogue. And then once that dialogue is ex has been exchanged, that, that, that real action that both can be youth led, but as well as some actions will be led by governments that will be led by, I guess, education institutions that will be led by businesses um, I, I think it's been touched across um, today that it, it is global citizenship is definitely something for, for everyone to take a part in. Um, we need to take a systems thinking within my climate change work is around how can we think as a system rather than thinking in silos and systems thinking is just everything is interwoven and that everything has sort of a trickle down effect for each other as well. So that, I, I think there's just such great opportunity for us to make make it right for what things have not been done as well in the past or things that now has been much more updated because that is what our generation wants and that I really hope to see that um, sort of flourish in the future. And that, that's a great way to kind of segue into our conclusions because we're, we're almost out of time. I think we could go on talking forever. Um, but let me ask each of you then briefly, because a, a lot of us, you know, you, you talk about systems thinking, um, often that that feels scary. What do we do as individuals, right? <laughs> so how do we actually make progress, whether we are policymakers, educators, students, or other leaders, you know, what are some of the actions we need to take? I can say, at AFS, there's some very practical things we have done. And I'd like to hear from, from each of you, either what you have done or what you 
will do or what you would advise others on this call to, to do. At, at AFS, we, I would say we did three key things in addition to, of course, advocating with governments to prioritize global citizenship education. But one is for all our exchange programs, we've enhanced our program content, right? And we um, blended essentially our core experience of AFS that is focused on intercultural learning and global competence development. Now also to add um, key aspects of change making and social impact through a partnership with the University of Pennsylvania and their Center for Social Impact Strategy. So changing the way we um, teach about these key concepts. Um, the second piece that we have done is, um, and this goes to one of the questions here, is to significantly expand our virtual education programming. And this is primarily through the Global Competence Certificate Program. Carla mentioned this. We have an amazing partnership with Education New Zealand that has incredibly quickly reached 1,000 young people in 13 or 15 countries across Asia Pacific. It's really quite astonishing. Yeah. But it's not just for young people, it's also for teachers, for educators, for other professionals. And I would say the third thing that we're doing is um, to create a platform for young people to learn the skills and get the tools to create social impact in their community. This is through a new initiative called the Youth Assembly. We're going to have our first Youth Assembly um, in New York in August 2022. We'll bring together a thousand young people from around the world who want to make impact in the world. The theme is called Dare to Reshape the World. And that's exactly, I think, kind of the sentiment we need, right? We need to dare to reshape the world. So let me then briefly go, um, Li Wei, your um, comment, just one minute, and then um, to Romina, and then we end with Carla. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. You, you touched a lot around um, what does it mean for social environmental impact. So really, this new thing around, well, not new thing, it's really happened in the past, is around ESG reporting. And our, our institutions, our businesses actually doing environmental social governance um, the reporting and what does that mean on a governance level and is that all considered because a lot of those values are held within our young people at this generation right now and and yes um, th there is a lot around education for young people but there's so much capability building that's needed for I guess my gener the generation I guess above me around educating them on how to engage with young people and how to actually um, build that trust build that reciprocation with it in terms of um, honesty um, there's a key sort of value here called manakitanga, which is around hospi being hospitable and being able to have that strong relationship. So um, I would sort of leave with like, um, sort of young people know what's best for the future. So how more, I guess, can you shape this world um, to sort of cater for young people's voices to be able to lead, whether if that's in your business, whether if that's within, I guess, education institutions as students, how can they be there? to actually be heard and be able to do as well. Excellent. Um, Romina, what about you? What's, what's your guidance? Well, first of all, continue advocating for dialogue, for dialogue to contextualize. Um, so, so countries and different key stakeholders, when you talk about countries, it's different uh, key stakeholders, um, think, understand why this is important and how they can, uh, how they can uh, change the way in global citizenship education and related issues are, are taught and how it can, con it can contribute to shape uh, their, 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 their country towards more democracy, inclusiveness, equity, sustainability. I also uh, want to, um, in this dialogue, I think it's important also to start expanding that idea of global citizenship education involving the ideas of social cohesion, social, social integration, and how also technologies can contribute to that. And the thinking that Lead said, Lead Wei Chin said, is um, if millions of people don't access uh, how politics and transformation and collective action can take place if millions of people don't access to, for example, connectivity and to computers. And that, that is how, how transformation can be built in different ways. I think that's, that's another thinking and how we can teach, uh, how, how we can edu educate in those different ways. So social, political participation to be responsible, to be committed, to be transformative, but also to reach those who have, connect, have connectivity and, and, and don't. And I finally think that um, 
but we'll continue, uh, as, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, supporting uh, the countries. We are implementing in Central America a program with the SECSICA, it's the Cultural and Education Coordination, the, the, the body of ministries and education of culture for a curriculum review, uh, also um, review in, in global citizenship education, teacher, teacher professional uh, development. And, and finally, I think one, one important thing for all of us is to think that there is participation out there. Participation has increased different forms. And it's important to, to teach when we teach, when we educate, is that we are not starting from zero. So young and mainly young people is already participating. We, we think that young people don't, part, don't participate. Look at the movements, look at the social transformation and political transformation in the last years in our world, and you will see young people participating. So we, we need to start thinking that that participation already exists and we have to reinforce that. Thank you. And I love that, I love that optimism. We're not starting from zero. Um, Carla, last word, you have 30 seconds and you also have to pronounce a word. I now forgot what it was, but there was a um, question Katie in the Tanga. chat. Yeah, Katiaki Tanga. So Katiaki is being guardian and Tanga is like of things that are precious to us. Um, okay, I will give my brief. How do I do it? And uh, I've got a really great champion in New Zealand, Libby Giles, this is her, her phrase, give it a role, a name and a place. And so I think the, make it somebody's job to implement this, have it really clear who's, who's leading this. Um, have it, you know, there are many definitions of, around global citizenship out there and people get really caught up on trying to define it. Uh, my advice is just pick one that works for you, that is simple enough, that relates to your principles. You can always keep, reinventing, refiguring out, reshaping, uh, but don't let it get you caught up. Just create a, a common language about it. Uh, and having a place, and we hope that Education New Zealand is that place for people alongside our partners so that you know you can come to us um, with your ideas, with your thoughts about global citizenship, and we can continue the conversation. And make it really clear for people, one bonus point, make it really clear for people and use their, as Romina said, use their everyday life. So that's why I like that idea of the mihi mihi, for example, Teach people who, what is their mountain? What is the river? Where do they come from? And then that creates that sense of both rights and obligations that help us be great kaitiaki. Thank you. That's the perfect way to end. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Li Wei. Thank you, Romina. Um, thank you all for participating. And um, Nikki will close us out by saying a word about some follow-up because I think a number of you have asked for resources. So Nikki, I let you have the very last word and close us out. Thank you so much to our wonderful panelists. This was such a great discussion. And thank you to the audience, to all of our participants for your excellent questions. So you'll receive an email following this with a link to a recording, links to some of the things that our panelists mentioned. You can also find a recording on AFS's YouTube channel. But I really also would ask if you have any questions, comments, there's something I don't send you. I'm Nikki Levinson Angulo. I'm the Director of Communications and Partner Engagement. And you can connect with me over email. It's in your webinar registration. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening or night.